Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Kia ora katoa, and good afternoon, and uh, thanks for a really awe-inspiring conference so far. It's been great. I want to begin by acknowledging a few people. I'd like to acknowledge my president, Andrew Little. Andrew, great speech yesterday. Thanks, mate. Thanks for all the work that you've done. And I want delegates to know this, that about this time next year, there'll be a Labour MP for New Plymouth to match the Labour Mayor for New Plymouth. And I'd like to acknowledge my Deputy Leader, Annette King. Annette King. Annette really has become the mother superior of the Labour Party caucus. She's been a great deputy. Uh, she's a wonderful friend. Thank you, Annette, for all of the work that you've put in as well. Uh, can I acknowledge my wife, Mary, in particular? I think every one of my colleagues down here know that uh, while the MPs are out doing the work, uh, the people that are working behind the scenes and keeping them going and supporting them uh, are their partners. And I want to thank Mary uh, for her love, for her understanding, and most of all for her tolerance. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> I acknowledge my caucus. It's a great team. It's a talented team. I can see about three or four cabinets that I could get out of that one team for the next Labour government. Thanks for being a great team. For being a great To Labour members, friends and supporters, to all of you here, you are the heart and the soul of the Labour Party. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for the hard work that you put in every week for our cause. Thank you for being there with us and the next Labour government will make you proud for our efforts. I want to start by talking about the two New Zealands that I saw last week. The first is the one that we're all familiar with. It's the place where people work hard, they pay their taxes and they look after their families. It's a place where, you know, when you get a new car, it's not quite a new car, second hand, not too many k's on the clock. It's the place where people go camping in January. It's a place where on a Friday night it's uh, fish and chips at home, watching a DVD uh, or watching the rugby. This is the New Zealand of many colours and many languages. It's the New Zealand that I grew up in, and it's the New Zealand that I love. But things are getting harder there, and I don't like that. This is the New Zealand where your pay doesn't go as far as it used to, because prices keep going up. There's not much left over at the end of the week, not as much as there used to be. People are worried about their jobs. For many, they may have had their hours cut. They or their friends have lost their jobs. The tax cuts that John Key promised them have disappeared because food costs more, their power costs more, going to the doctor costs more, rents cost more, everything costs more. On this side of town, it's tough and it's getting tougher. But last week I experienced the other New Zealand. It was a beautiful, high quality Auckland hotel with beautiful people, dinner and cocktails. This, for this New Zealand, things have got much easier and they're getting better still. And there's plenty left over at the end of the week. In this New Zealand, overseas holidays and luxury cars come easily. Good on them for doing well. But in this New Zealand, it's getting better for them because they're getting the lion's share of the tax cuts. And therefore, the other New Zealand is getting a smaller share. John Key chose to put them first and everyone else second. And that's not right. It's not fair and we will change that. Labor will make our tax system fairer. We'll grow a stronger economy that works for all New Zealanders, not just the few. You know, I saw a comment from John Key the other day, and he said New Zealand's doing just fine. A year ago, he said that by this time we'd be growing aggressively out of recession. I saw the Finance Minister say the fundamentals are strong. I saw the Prime Minister say 
Unemployment isn't going up. It's just that the statistics are volatile. <laughs> you know they're wrong. I know they're wrong. And I'm telling you, they are not being straight with New Zealand. Jobs are being lost. 20,000 additional New Zealanders lost their jobs in the last quarter. The Finance Minister describes this as a necessary rebalancing. And he said the unemployed are collateral damage. I say to Mr English, human beings are not collateral damage. You reject any rebalancing that means that people are being thrown on the scrap heap. I reject a rebalancing that brings higher prices, lower wages and job losses. How about some rebalancing that isn't at the expense of working people, Mr Key and Mr Ringley? You know, family budgets are under pressure. Prices are rising faster than wages. And in 2010, two years into the national government's term, it's their fault. Median incomes are down $9 a week. You know, that's the worst result since June 1999. That was the last time National was in government. <laughs> National has put the recovery on hold. Yeah. I opened a supermarket, a new world in May Road in my electorate a couple of weeks ago. 150 jobs, really welcome. I said to the manager, the owner of the store, I said, that's great, this is fantastic. How many people applied for the jobs? You know what he told me? 2,700. 2,700 people in my city applying for 150 jobs. And I say, Paula Bennett, think again before you start blaming the unemployed for being unemployed. The problem out here is that it's not enough for I've been going around, right around the country from Invercargill up to uh, Kaikoui. And everywhere I go, the retailers and the builders, whoever I speak to, tell me that business actually has never been worse. And the reason? It's obvious, isn't it? When working people don't have money in their pockets to spend, nobody does well. And that is the situation at the moment. It's not about, as Bill English would have it, uh, people <laughs> saving more, paying off their mortgage. People simply don't have as much money in their pocket to cover the price rises that have hit them. National has no idea about how to create the jobs that we need, and nor do they have any commitment to it. All that National has created so far are gimmicks and excuses, cycleways, job summits, mining our national parks. That won't do it, and that's not good enough. You know John Key's latest claim? He says summer is coming and that will save us. Well, <laughs> God help us if that's what the national government is relying on. In 2008, New Zealand along with the rest of the world did face a global financial summit. But that's now behind us. And instead of things getting better for New Zealand, our recovery is stuttering. It shouldn't be. Two years of a national government and we're going backwards not forwards. We should be going forwards. Australia is our biggest trading partner. China is our second biggest partner. 20% growth in trade with China in the last, uh, in Australia in the last year, 15% with China. They are growing strongly. They're buying our goods. And export prices, dairy, forestry, wool, are at an all-time high. But New Zealand is not growing. And the incomes of Kiwi households are falling. And I say, that's National's fault. <coughs> Baycorp is, predict is predicting a massive spike in the number of people in coming months who can't pay their bills. But National put GST up when families could least afford it, and retailers have told me this could not have happened at a worse time. They moved the tax burden off the top but a lot of New Zealanders have ended up worse off. National has cut wages, they've cut wages and jobs, 
and they've legislated to cut working conditions. And one of the very first things that the next Labour government will do is to remove that piece of legislation that says that Kiwis can be sacked in the first 90 days. will never accept such a law. Nobody, nobody should lose their livelihood, their job, without good cause. It's wrong and we'll get rid of it. If you want to know why most families are working harder and not getting ahead, it's because the so-called tax cuts gave 42% of the money to the top 10% and 2% to the bottom 22%. That's wrong. Shame. This government has hundreds of dollars a week for tax cuts for ministers, but apparently they don't have the money for tax cuts for ordinary New Zealanders. Those who get huge tax breaks need to pay their share so that middle and low income New Zealanders can pay less tax. And you know, next month, the people of Mana will choose a new MP. It'll be a judgment on John Key and the national government's failure to produce jobs, failure to lift wages, and failure to make the future better. And that's why they'll send Chris Farfoy back to Parliament. It starts in mana and it goes on until we're in government and Labor will put it right. We'll make the essentials more affordable. We'll stop using, for example, the power companies as a cash cow for the government. And with the world's third highest rate of obesity, we'll axe the tax from fresh fruit and vegetables so that people can afford to make you know, taking GST off fresh fruit and vegetables will probably save the typical family around three or four hundred dollars a year. And Bill English says that isn't much. Well, to him it isn't. You know, he gave himself and his household three or four hundred dollars extra a week and then demanded twenty dollars more to pay for the cleaning of his own home. The reason that the economy has stalled and people are struggling is that John Key and Bill English gave themselves and their mates the big tax cuts, they kept the tax breaks and they left the crumbs for the rest. For those who do the work, for the hard-working Kiwi families, New Zealand can do better than this. Let me tell you where my values were created. I'm the product of a family with a modest income that worked hard. We weren't a poor farmer, fa we weren't a poor family, uh, but we weren't privileged either. Uh, Dad worked as a railway tradesman, Mum worked hard at home, there's the, ra the uh, railway union there, <laughs> Mum worked hard at home to give her kids the best start that she could for their lives. Our house was just like uh, hundreds of thousands of other houses in the towns and the suburbs of New Zealand, but we were raised to believe that in New Zealand you could make a good life for yourself. If you worked hard, you could get ahead. If you helped out, at the local school and the sports club, and you've met your responsibilities, the government would give you a fair go. That was the Kiwi dream. It offered families like ours a good education at, at just the, the local state school. It offered affordable health care. It gave us a home to call our own. And it offered security in old age. You know, the Kiwi dream involved a basic sense of fairness that the rungs of the ladder reached down to where everyone grew up. There were jobs that you could get if you trained and you worked hard. Those jobs would pay well enough for you to realise some of the other parts of the Kiwi dream. Homes and small businesses were within reach of those who worked and saved. That's the New Zealand that I'm from. And I say to the families working their guts out in the towns and the suburbs, that I'm a product of a family just like yours. And that's why I'm Labour. 
And when I'm Prime Minister, you won't be forgotten anymore. You know, those who are working hard and trying to get ahead have been forgotten. Hard-working families have been overlooked. Tens of thousands of jobs have been lost. Businesses are struggling to survive. They haven't had enough savings to invest in technology to increase productivity and incomes. And wealth has become more and more concentrated in a fewer hands. Farm and house prices have got so high that we're risking a New Zealand where who owns what is decided by how much wealth you inherit instead of by personal effort. And that's wrong. It's not just a widening gap between those at the top and everybody else, but it's also a widening gap between the young and everyone else. Younger New Zealanders are being shut out of home ownership. It's falling sharply. They take on debt when they start out in their education and they get swamped in more debt when they try to buy a home or a farm or a small business. But the government keeps piling more costs onto the next generation. They'll have to pay for our future retirement costs because National has stopped contributing to the Cullen Fund and cut KiwiSaver. And they were some of the best things that the last Labor government did to be fair to the then there were the changes that they made to carbon emissions. You know, the purpose of having an emissions trading scheme was to send a price signal to those causing pollution to find alternative ways so that they could reduce their pollution. The national government has taken the burden off the polluters and put it on you, the taxpayers. You know the Treasury figure? $110 billion, and that is a cost being loaded onto the next generation, and that's wrong as well. The National's tearing strips from our social services that will create long-term costs. Mental illness rises. Teen pregnancy increases. Substance abuse, obesity, poor health get worse. Growing inequality as the rich get richer and the rest fall behind will make people feel less safe less confident in their own community because crime increases and fear increases even faster. Unfair, unequal countries cost everyone, not just those at the bottom. Unfairness makes the boat go slower. We all lose when any one of us are denied opportunity and denied the chance to contribute, and that is happening to too many New Zealanders today. It's time to renew the Kiwi dream, a country in which every child gets the best possible start in life, where everyone gets access to health care, education, a decent home and a decent job, where this country becomes again, as Annette has said, the best country in the world to raise children. That's what the Labor government will be achieving in its next term. New Zealand, where we can make a better life for all New Zealanders. We are going to make our country the country that it was meant to be. But we have a lot of work to do to get there. I want to tell you about someone I want to offer hope and optimism to. He's just lost his job when the firm that he works at went bust. It was a good job and he worked really hard. He and his wife are in their early 30s. They've got a couple of kids. But I have to tell you, they voted national last time because they thought they were trying, we were trying to tell them how to run their lives. We've got to rise to the challenge of winning that family back. We've got to be honest about why we lost their support. And we have to challenge ourselves to change to win it back. Changing ourselves might not make us comfortable. But if we're to govern <coughs> after the next election, they need to know the clear alternatives that we offer and that we are on their side. It's not about changing our values. Our values are enduring. It's about ensuring that what we're talking about is what matters to them. So delegates, we'll get back into government by persuading families like theirs that we can help them achieve the Kiwi dream. We're going to campaign on a promise 
to put their interests first. We're going to show that we're not the party of you can't do that. We must be the party of we can do this, and we can do this. We need to be clear about how we want to govern. We want to be the party that helps people get ahead. We have to be the party that stands up for the vulnerable and the low income earners, but also the party of those on middle incomes, the 60, 70, $80,000 brackets. They're not rich, and we need to deliver to them as well. We can do this. We must be the party that stands for Kiwi families working hard to achieve their dreams. The party of New Zealanders that wants someone to speak out for them. And that's why I'm fighting to create high paying jobs. That's why I'm fighting to ensure that every New Zealander goes to work confident that their wages are going to get better, not worse. Last month, while New Zealand was shedding jobs, Australia added 50,000. They've added a quarter of a million jobs so far this year in Australia, mainly full time. He said that he'd closed the gap with Australia. But I've got to tell you this, we won't close that gap with Australia while we're under investing in skills and education. We won't close that gap while Australia is spending more on research and development and this national government has cut the research and development grants that Labor introduced. Australia saves more than we do. And that's why, when I'm Prime Minister, Labor will increase our savings for the future, not cut them as National did immediately on getting into office. Labor's going to make some tough calls to ensure that our exporting businesses are competitive, some big calls. We'll change monetary policy. We'll make the Reserve Bank more supportive of employment and exports. We'll, we work alongside industry and our universities to grow research and development. We'll boost skill training when this government last week cut out $55 million for industry skill training at the very time we need those skills. We believe that the future for New Zealand is in the connected, global, high-wage, high-skill growth industries of the 21st century. Our growth will be clean, green and clever. It won't be about mining our national parks. It will be consistent with our branding of a New Zealand which is striving to be 100% pure. New Zealand companies are at the forefront of innovation in clean technology. We have to back them if they're going to unleash their potential, and Labor is developing good ideas to back them. If you want to use your savings to support innovative and entrepreneurial Kiwi exporters who are creating jobs and competing, then we're going to help you to do it. We need more savings, and our innovators and our exporters need more New Zealand capital, and we will bring those things together. Labor will go into the next election with clear plans that go further than New Zealand has gone before in lifting our savings and investment. We have to, because we need to own more of the wealth-generating economy. New Zealand cannot spend its way to prosperity. We cannot borrow our way to higher incomes or to better jobs. Instead of selling New Zealand off, what we need to do is make it more attractive for New Zealanders who have something to save to put more into New Zealand. We'll back Kiwi firms. And when we build new trains, we'll look first to Dunedin and to Wellington to build it. Increasing our savings will allow us to own more of our own future. It's time we reconsidered what benefit New Zealand gets from selling our farmland offshore and what are the costs of those sales? You know, Kiwi farmers are the most efficient in the world. We're not going to make them more efficient by making more of them overseas owned. <laughs> selling off our farmland won't increase production or export earnings. There are big overseas buyers with money to burn who would dearly love to control and own the supply chain for food production. They're purchasing land all over the world. The problem with that 
if they buy up our farms, they then have the power not to add value to that production in New Zealand, but to ship it off unprocessed and do the value adding and create the jobs overseas. And that would cost us jobs here in New Zealand. They're coming here to buy what is currently ours, and they will be doing it more often. We become even more vulnerable as land prices fall. Assets like the Crafer Farms have been put up at the behest of the banks. But what's in the bank's interests is not always, and isn't in this case, in the interests of wider New Zealand. We're at a risk of our land being priced on the international market and being priced beyond the reach of New Zealanders. When New Zealanders have to compete against overseas buyers, we have to ask ourselves, what will happen if the prices lock us out of owning our own land? Where does it end up when we say to the ambitious young New Zealanders that you can only buy into the best and most productive assets if you come from overseas or if you have inherited wealth? That's not the New Zealand I want. No overseas person has the right to buy our land. It's a privilege. And it's a privilege, I have to say, that we have granted all too easily. Today, you have my commitment that Labour will turn the rules on selling land to foreigners on their head. We'll guarantee that New Zealand interests are put first. And we'll do that by reversing the presumption that any foreign purchase of rural land in New Zealand is good for our country. It'll mean that instead of most applications to purchase our farmland being approved, most will be turned down. Buyers will have to prove that selling land to them will be good for our country. We will force would-be buyers of New Zealand rural land to invest in New Zealand and our people. They'll have to bring jobs or technology, increase exports or bring other benefits for New Zealand. These rules will apply to land over the size of five hectares. We will also introduce new rules around investment in monopoly infrastructure. New rules will guarantee that crucial assets such as airports, seaports and our water supplies remain in New Zealand's hands. And you know, of course, there's another way of doing that, and it'll be a big issue at the next election. This national government, if re-elected, will seek to privatise our critical state-owned assets. And I give you this guarantee that the next Labour government will not be selling off the, ish the assets that are crucial to New Zealand's future. We'll be retaining them community-owned and community-owned. What I'm saying today is that there are areas where it is not a benefit to New Zealand to sell off our assets overseas. But Labour is in favour, generally, of foreign investment where it is good for New Zealand and where it will work on our behalf. If you want to buy into New Zealand, then you have to bring something to offer to New Zealand. If you do, we'll welcome you. We'll actually make it easier for investment in some critical areas that will bring growth, will bring jobs, will bring trans, uh, trans technology transfer to New Zealand. But if you don't bring those things, then we're not interested in the investment. I've spent many years representing New Zealand around the world. And I tell you this, that no country that I can think of would find the rules that we are proposing to be unusual. This is a change for Labour, and it is a change for New Zealand. It's part of reassessing what hasn't worked. We must be bold enough to say what isn't working, and strong enough to make the changes where that is the case. Maori-owned assets are some of our biggest industry sectors. Maori are now the biggest meat exporters in New Zealand. And Maori businesses, some of the biggest players in energy, in forestry and in fisheries. They offer opportunities for jobs and higher incomes for New Zealand if we can better align training and skills development with their needs as they grow. There are tracts of marginal Maori land that could be afforested so that we can take advantage of carbon farming and biofuel opportunities. 
That will need skills and trades and technology. They'll need management and enterprise skills. And that's why the next Labor government will be rejuvenating and strengthening our system of modern apprenticeships. And as part of that, we'll have a focus on modernised Maori trade training, aligned to the needs of industry where there is a strong Maori asset base. We'll work with the people who keep ownership and jobs onshore in New Zealand rather than exporting those jobs overseas. We're looking at providing specialist training institutions in schools. They could raise educational achievement and equip our young people with the skills needed for huge opportunities in our region. You know, we must do better. When half of our teenage Māori and Pacifica young women are currently not in education, not in training, and not in work. One in two, and we're one in three of our Māori and Pacific teenage boys are likewise out of work and not in skill training or education. That's not just a personal disaster for those individuals. It's a social and economic disaster for New Zealand, and we have to change that. The best policy we have to provide a future for 38,000 unemployed teenagers. The best policy we have to keep at home our best and our brightest. The best policy for keeping down crime and alcohol and drug abuse is our expanding of the smart economy with high wages and high skilled jobs. <laughs> Labour is fighting to put government back on the side of hard-working New Zealanders so that we don't have those two New Zealands that I talked about earlier anymore. And that's why Labour is fighting for parents trying to raise their kids to give them the best possible chance in life. That's why we're fighting Nationals Cuts, $480 million worth of them to early education. National is dropping standards and it's increasing the costs to struggling parents. I'm proud of the progress that Labor made in government in early education. And when we are back in government, we will restore the priority back to early education to give every one of our children the best possible start to their education and their future. fighting so that our next generation have a better future to look forward to. National came to power promising a brighter future for everyone and they've delivered only for the most privileged. They're failing. They came to power promising higher incomes and they delivered higher GST. They're failing. They came to power promising more employment and they've delivered more unemployment. They're failing. John Key has no game plan for our cities and our farms so that they can compete and win in the global community. I do. He won't stand up for Kiwi workers who want their wages to rise faster than prices. I will. John Key won't break the stranglehold that the privileged have on our government, but I will. John Key won't take on the big foreign investors who are trying to buy up our farmland and our assets, I will. National won't bring unemployment down, but Labor did. We gave young people skills and we brought unemployment down to record low levels. John Key's national government has never achieved a budget surplus. In the last nine years, Labor did nine times. Jobs, higher wages, a break for families. These are not just our commitments, they are our Kiwi dream. We are the party that stands for New Zealanders' dreams for a better life. We are the party that stands against having two New Zealands. 
we are the party of a stronger economy that works for the many, not the few. Surely New Zealand deserves the leadership that asks what can we do to make the future better for everyone. Leadership that will call for a place at the table for every New Zealander. Leadership that calls on each New Zealander to join in a common endeavour, lift us all up, reward hard work and reward responsibility. I believe this. I believe we can do it. I want to lead New Zealand there. We can do this. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.